the fate of humanity. The time to choose sides has come. We are the resistance. We are the info war. We've got an important, interesting show today. You're not going to want to miss this. We have an extended documentary style interview between Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson. First time ever aired anywhere. I haven't even seen it. But I'm anxious to see it because they're talking about things like the attack on the Second Amendment. Where is this going to lead? The rise of the libertarian movement. And Alex shows Tucker Carlson something that he said he hadn't seen before. Building 7, falling down on its own, free fall. So it'll be interesting comments about that. We've also got uh, a, a story here that was about, uh, if you remember Alex when he was talking to Tucker Carlson in studio. In the context, they were talking about how... The Democrat Party is using race baiting, trying to divide one group against another and how they've done this for a very long time and to their advantage. And Alex pointed out that this is a strategy that the Democrats have used for quite some time. When it was to their advantage, they allied themselves with the Ku Klux Klan. Then when it looked like things were going the other way, they abruptly did a 180. And he was scoffed at and ridiculed by MSNBC and the Young Turks. Well, we've got a special report that's coming up in the bottom of the hour. And we're going to break that down for you. We don't make those kinds of statements. We don't talk about things that we can't prove, that we don't have documentation for. That's not what InfoWars does. So information is going to back that up. And uh, that's going to be reported at the bottom of the news hour. But we've got a lot of breaking news that's coming out. We've got a couple of articles here that are on the Drudge Report today. One of them, a surcharge is now appearing on restaurant bills across the country. That's an InfoWars store from a Don Salazar. You know, people who have small businesses are already in a very dire strait. They can't just absorb these costs endlessly without going out of business. And so we see that they're already incurring costs associated with this. Of course, if you're a large corporate donor or a special interest group that's allied with Obama, he's going to give you a pass. And now we see that even individual mandates are being talked about giving a pass on this. Let's extend this past the, uh, the deadline of the election. In other words, he knows how harmful this is. He knows how it's destroying businesses, large and small, but especially the small businesses. So for his friends and allies or for voters, let's just kick this can down the road. Let's not let people see the pain of this until after the next election. Because if they really understand what's going on, you're going to see a major sea change. And I think you're already seeing that. A poll this week showed that only 14% of the people supported Obamacare, thought that it was a good thing. And what's up with those 14%? I mean, don't they understand how this is impacting their wages? Don't they understand how it's making it difficult for them to get jobs? People are cutting back the number of employees they have. They're cutting them down to very low hours, less than full time, so they don't have to buy these Cadillac insurance plans. And, of course, there's just a news article today that said that only 10% of the uninsured have picked up on Obamacare. Why is that? Well, it's because they can't afford it. It's the Affordable Care Act is not affordable, just like the Patriot Act from George Bush was not patriotic. They always give it a title of, of exactly the opposite of what it is. You can't afford to buy a health insurance plan that if you're a single man requires you to have, gives you maternity coverage, gives you coverage for children that you don't have. Uh, you don't need that kind of coverage. That kind of stuff is mandated all over the place for Obamacare. That's why people are seeing their rates go up by a factor of two, by a factor of three, by a factor of five. Because they've got things in there that people don't want. They're mandates. They're not just mandating that you have insurance, but they're mandating that you buy Cadillac policies that you can't afford. That's why it's unaffordable. That's why only 10% of the uninsured have even bothered to get new insurance under this. And it's why he's giving exemptions to different people. But we see that restaurants are pulling that in. 
globalists have controlled the mainstream media for a long time, but now they're expanding, making the weaponization even more vicious and deceptive. All the major networks are state-run. We are partnering this year with the NFL. The NFL has become a political weapon against the Second Amendment and pushes Obamacare. MSNBC tells us that our children belong to the state. We have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. The brainwashing media machine has been turned up on high and it's time for humanity to double down on the true people's media and strike back against the tyrants that are destroying our civilization with their lies and fraud. We are the resistance. You are the resistance. You are the info war. It is more important than ever to realize that we are not the alternative media. We are the true media. The establishment dinosaur press is dying. We are in an information war and we are losing that war. Join us at InfoWarsNews.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. Members can share their memberships with up to 11 people. By subscribing, you will literally be buying war bonds in the info war to expand our operation in the face of the tyrants. Join us at PrisonPlanet.tv. And when Tucker Carlson was in studio, he and Alex were talking about how the Democrats have been essentially, you know, every, everything that works in the political environment works by breaking people down into two parties, right? You have to be either Democrat or Republican, you have to be either white or black. They, they love to divide and conquer the populace. And they were talking about it in that context. They were talking about how the Democrats try to portray everything, every disagreement as being racist. And so Alex pointed out that really the Democrats have a very long history with the Ku Klux Klan and with racism. And of course, the mainstream liberal media like MSNBC and the Young Turks just howled in derision about that, they're scoffing at that. Well, you know what? We've got a documentary report about that coming at, at the bottom of this hour from John Bound. And we're going to talk about that, break down the evidence. So we don't just make wild, crazy claims. There's a reason for what we said. I grew up in the Deep South. I grew up in Florida. There was only one political party there, the Democrats. The Ku Klux Klan was pretty strong in the Democrats. Look at Robert Byrd out of West Virginia. We've got Supreme Court justices like Hugo Black, who was associated with them. There's even associations with Harry Truman. I mean, it just goes on and on. You've got uh, Democrat congressmen saying, you know, I once you're a Klan, once you're a Ku Klux, you're always a Ku Klux. I mean, it just, there's a lot of evidence there. It's not being made up. It's actually a fact. We've got that broken down in a report by John Bound at the bottom of the hour. So you're going to want to catch that. Now, there's a lot of breaking news. We had a story yesterday that was picked up on Drudge Report about the Obamacare surcharges being put on by a lot of restaurants across the country. You know, only 14% of the people think that Obamacare is a good thing. Now, obviously, those 14% of the people don't understand how it's affecting employment. They don't understand how people are getting part-time jobs because the employers can't afford to put them on these Cadillac insurance policies. And they're not even part-time in the sense that we've thought of part-time. Obama redefined a full-time job as being 30 hours, not 40 hours. So they're having to cut people's hours down to say maybe 20 hours a week. So if you're a working poor person, you've got to get multiple jobs just to get enough money to survive. That makes it very difficult. You've got to juggle schedules between different employers. Maybe you can do that. Maybe you can't. But evidently, these 14% of the people don't understand or don't care about that. Maybe they don't understand that employers can't afford to just swallow those costs. Now what you're seeing is, and maybe they'll understand this, when they see a surcharge on their pizza bill, and they see that that's from the Affordable Care Act, is making their pizza less affordable. Maybe that will get their attention. And this story from Don Salazar that was up yesterday, he points out that a, a pizza shop in Denver is adding a 5% charge to customers' bills in order to pay for half, half of the health care costs of their employees, both full and part-time. 5% so surcharge to just pay for half of the Affordable Care Act. There's another restaurant chain in Florida adding a 1% surcharge right now to customers' bills. And this is even before it's gone into effect, but they're pointing out that they still have costs of compliance and they're trying to get this, uh, they're, they're breaking this out separately. People are complaining about that, but you know, we see that happen all the time with public utility companies. They're constantly breaking out. When you look at your bill, there's a lot of breakouts for additional surcharges that get mandated by the government. And of course, the Supreme Court 
said that Obamacare was a tax. It's a valid thing to break that out, just like it's a valid thing to break out a sales tax. Now, there's been a lot of news about Bitcoin. We've had a Bitcoin conference here in Austin. And we've had uh, Stefan Molyneux as well as Ben Swan, who were at the conference. They were in studio the last couple of days. We've had very interesting interviews with them. Alex talked to them here on the radio show. We had interviews with them on the nightly news. And we aired the one from Stefan Molyneux last uh, night on the nightly news. We will be airing the one with Ben Swan later. But now there's some interesting news. Bitcoin has been in the news a lot, of course, with Mt. Gox, the largest exchange, declaring bankruptcy. A lot of people are questioning it. And then this week, it kind of doubled down. We had a couple of more exchanges go out of business. We had Flexcoin that lost $620,000, and they shut their doors. We had Polynex that lost another 12% of their users' coins. And now we've got some news about the creator of Bitcoin, but before I go to that, let me let me backtrack here just a little bit and talk about Flexcoin and Polynex because this is one of the comments that both Stefan Molyneux and Ben Swan had. They were saying that it's a good thing when bad actors like Mt. Gox or people who don't handle the money well go out of business. We don't see that in the fiat banking system, the Federal Reserve. We have banks that are too large to fail. They're not allowed to fail. Instead, they just keep going and going and going, these zombie banks, and they're bailed out. By the public. That's not a good thing. In a free market, you're going to have failures. In a free market, people are going to lose money. It's a caveat emptor type of thing. And I, I agree with that. I think that is a good thing to, to a degree. But I think for Bitcoin to move forward, they've got a lot of trust to build. See, there's, there's FDIC insurance that makes people feel good about putting their money in the bank. And of course, we've already seen that banks are starting to arbitrarily say, I'm sorry, you can't withdraw that amount of money. Uh, we're going to put a limit on you. You can't take out uh, all of your money at once. Now, these are demand deposits. That's why you <laughs> call them demand deposits. You should be able to get your money out right away. But we've seen some of the bigger banks start to enact what we believe is the beginning of currency control. So there's a lot of risk with that. But in general, people have felt safe because they've had FDIC insurance. There is no insurance in Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a lot of the benefits as well as the risks of cash. You've got the anonymity, and we all like that. You've got the transportability. You can hold it yourself, essentially, if you don't put it in these exchanges that seem to be a bit dodgy. But then you don't have any insurance. So what they've got before them, if they want to keep this cryptocurrency going, and I hope they do, because one of the reasons that we like Stefan Melano and, and um, Ben Swan like this, I like it because the idea of it because we want to see an alternative currency that can be independent and apart from the manipulations of the central banks. And we want to see something that's going to protect people's privacy. So if we want to see this succeed, what these different Bitcoin people are going to have to do is they're going to have to educate the public. And even though they can't insure these Bitcoins, they're going to have to assure us that they're safe, that there's some way that they have of tracking this. What happened with both Flexcoin and Polynex is not a failure of Bitcoin per se, just like Mt. Gox was not necessarily a failure of Bitcoin. A lot of people are pointing, I don't know the details of that, but in this article, what they pointed out with Flexcoin, for example, was that someone successfully exploited a flaw in the code that would allow transfers between Flexcoin users. See, that's a very different thing than a fundamental flaw in Bitcoin architecture. So what they did was they looked at what was happening within Flexcoin, where people were transferring money back and forth to themselves and they started moving coins back and forth exploiting this flaw similar thing happened with polynex so the hacker discovered that if they placed several withdrawals all in practically the same instant that they would get processed more or less at the same time even though they would get a negative balance the polynex withdrawal demon was not looking at that negative balance and so they were able to pull out a lot of coins using that exploit so that's something you always have to worry about. You always have to worry about as well the fact that it's got a small market cap. When we look at what the government and the central banks have done to manipulate the price of gold, for example, we know that they're manipulating the price of gold. We know that the uh, Hunt brothers manipulated the price of silver, tried to corner that market. We know that George Soros essentially broke the Bank of England. So it's such a small market cap that you could have one rogue billionaire like a George Soros that could play games with the value of Bitcoin. We also know that we've got 
an agency like the NSA that loves to break codes. They live for that. <laughs> They're very, very good at it. And as William Benny said when I was talking to him about secure email, about Bitcoin, he said there's no code that we can't break. It's just a matter of time. And of course, people will respond to their code breaking with other codes. So as he pointed out, it's a back and forth game, but it's constantly evolving. There isn't any code that they can't break. And so now with this story that we have today, we see that the alleged Bitcoin founder, his name is Satoshi Nakamoto, did classified work for the U.S. military. So this raises some interesting questions. He said when he was caught by Newsweek, he said, I'm no longer involved in that and I cannot discuss it. It's been turned over to other people. They're now in charge of it and I no longer have any connection. But then later, he said, told the Associated Press, it sounded like I was involved before Bitcoin and looks like I'm not involved now. That's not what I meant. I want to clarify that. Well, he didn't really clarify it, but his brother said that, uh, said of him, my brother is an a-hole. What you don't know about him is that he's working on classified stuff. His life was a complete blank for a while. You're not going to be able to get to him. He'll deny everything. He'll never admit to starting Bitcoin. And he did classified work for major corporations and the U.S. military, according to this report from Newsweek. And so the question that some people are asking is, is he working for the government? Did they create Bitcoin as some kind of a backdoor uh, way to, to, to grab people, to try to push people to a digital currency? I don't know. Coming up in the next segment, we're going to have John Bowne's special report about Democrats and the Ku Klux Klan. As part of Alex and Tucker Carlson's initial interview here in the studio, the subject of how the Democrats race bait and subdivide the population into competing groups came up. And so Alex pointed out that the Democrats have had a very, very long association with the Ku Klux Klan. And of course, mainstream media could not believe that, came up and ridiculed that. Oh, really? Well, you know what? John just came in and told me, he said, there are so many connections. He didn't have time for all of them in the 10-minute report, but it's a, it's a great report. So you're going to want to see that. That's going to be in the next or listen to that if you're listening on the radio. It's a good radio report. We're going to have that in the next segment. But let's take a look at some of the news today. We've got Russia reportedly halting all exports to the U.S. of Russian-made ammunition. Now, this is a big deal because... Remember, as we had the ammunition shortages because the massive purchases of Homeland Security and other government agencies, we had massive shortages. That was alleviated somewhat by the importation of Russian arms. And now, because of the new buildup in the Cold War, this tension, as Obama is threatening to put embargoes against Russia, Russia says, I see your bluff and I'm going to raise the ante in the poker game. And so it just keeps getting worse and worse. Now we see that this is another aspect as they're pointing out, this one person reported and said the largest wholesale gun and ammo distributors in the U.S. have informed us in a private conversation today that a massive scramble is on for all 7.62 as Russia has reportedly halted all exports to the U.S. of Russian-made ammunition. And they say that just in the last 10 hours, they sold out of every last round they had. Now, that report is up on Infowars.com from uh, Max Slavo. And uh, we also have... Obama, if you remember, yesterday, he put an embargo on critics. So he's going to not only stop the flow of goods to Russia, he thinks, but he's also going to stop any criticisms from flowing into the United States, or at least the critics from coming into the United States. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that he's got his uh, pen and he's just going to, by edict, say that if you disagree with his characterization of a foreign conflict, you're not going to be allowed in the United States? Why is Obama taking it so personally? This is something that's happening in a foreign country. Can't people have an opinion about that? I mean, we, we're supposed to have free speech, free thought here in the United States. But the fact that he cracks down on this so heavily tells you, doesn't it, that he is involved with the architects of this crisis that is being perpetrated right on the steps of Russia. And if that weren't enough, we have news from CPAC. We see speeches coming out. Of course, Ted Cruz has spoken there. Marco Rubio has spoken there. John Bolton has spoken there. Bolton is just decrying the isolationism of America. <laughs> Can you believe that? The isolationism? 
we're trying to start wars everywhere. Obama goes from one attempted war and to, to try in Syria to trying to start a war now with Russia, at least to restart the Cold War between Russia and the West, trying to start an economic trade war. You got John Boehner saying, it's okay if, if Gazprom shuts off natural gas to Europe, we'll supply them with some natural gas. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's exactly what they would like to do. Maybe... Department of Homeland Security loves the idea that Russia is not going to be selling ammunition to the United States. Maybe Boehner and his allies would love to sell gas and oil to Europe instead of having them buy it from the Russians. Maybe the banker that got put in as prime minister of the new Ukrainian democracy, the post-coup democracy that they've got there, if you could call it that. They haven't had an election, so I don't know if you could call it a democracy. But that former banker says that he would like to put uh, the pipelines on the auction block, the Gazprom pi pipeline. So I think there's a profit motive going on here, just as there is in every war. In every war, they want to make money for the military industrial complex, the people that make the weapons. And of course, it's been a long time since the Cold War segment of the military industrial complex has been able to do that. I'm sure they would love to have that profit center restarted. They've, of course, got the new profit center of militarizing the police in America and creating a police state. And they can provide all the over-the-top, expensive, Pentagon-style overkill, like these armored tanks that they're giving to police departments. And the police come out and say, yeah, we, we love having this because nobody's going to ever consider challenging us with these. It's just all about intimidation. And it's all about profiteering. And they've got that profit center, but they want to restart the Cold War because that'll give them a whole new excuse for a lot of new types of weapons. You are watching the best of the Alex Jones Show, weekdays from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Central. Watch live at InfoWars.com forward slash show or become a member of InfoWarsNews.com and help us take resistance to the next level.